So now we actually are in the um, section of example hands where we're going to look at a few steel scenarios, um, actually back to back. And here we've got a pair of sixes in the small blind. And we're playing NL50 again, so Diamond Jack and I are both um, big stacked. And we've got a couple small stackers around. Uh, this would be an example of a professional small stacker, by the way, at 7 and 7 for 7 VPIP and 7 percentage raise. That means this guy's a professional short stacker. Um, let's see here. This guy's also looking like a pro at 13.8, a bit of a looser professional short stack player. This guy over here at 26.13, uh, super aggressive post flop. Um, definitely not a professional short stack player. Um, maybe playing a big stack strategy and just take a hit, who knows. So, uh, Just kind of wrap up. Uh, kind of recap a little bit on the stats there. You're looking at short stacks. Are they fish or are they pros? You know, so how's that going to affect you? Uh, NL15, and here we go. So, professional short stacker under the gun folds, as he very often will. And it's folded to us, and we make a three big blind steel move from the small blind. Okay, into the big blind. And Mr. Diamond Jack, uh, we had a little history here. He then three bets me which is a proper 3-bet size here at um, 450 plus his, his blind, so he, he raises it to 550, giving me pot odds of just under 2 to 1. All right, so I need about 35-36% equity uh, to make that call, um, but as we're both deep stacked, you know, you're not necessarily only looking at the equity that you need to make the call, you're also looking at the probability that you'll be able to push him off of hands, which is quite high since he's only getting to the showdown 16% of the time. Uh, of course, this stat can be misleading, uh, especially in so-called blind versus blind battles. This is a so-called blind battle that we're in right here. So I raise, just to take down that big blind, which he's going to give to me 75% of the time. He then three bets me. He makes a re-steal. Okay, so versus a steal from the big blind, you see that fold, call, and three bet on the bottom left corner. He is 3-betting 25% of the time. Yeah, he's folding 75% of the time, and of course the difference is what he calls, um, namely never. So this guy's either raising or folding from the big blind, and he's actually, this guy proved to be a, a really solid player over time. And so we get into it out of position <laughs> uh, versus a guy here that we did have a little history with, and this is a good example of, as I said, a blind versus blind battle in a steel scenario. So we opt just for the call. All right, we're both deep stacked or big stacked still. A lot of poker to be played post flop, and that's what the action brings. So, ace two three two suited, and he is the pre flop aggressor. So he has the initiative right now. So if I check, he's going to be able to make his c bet uh, in our little three bet pot here. All right, which is at this point 22 big blinds because we're playing nl 50. And I opt for a check raise in this blind battle. Right, so I check it. He bets only, uh, actually, a little under half pot. All right, and I'm thinking, okay, he wants to represent the ace. We're too suited. I could be uh, raise calling any ace. If he doesn't have the ace, he'll probably let it go right now. So I make a hefty check raise bluff. And that's what that looks like. So he bets the five. I pop it to three times his bet, giving him three to one pot odds, and he then lets that go, believing that I had the ace. Different moves that you guys can make. All right, next hand, we're here again in the big blind, NL50, suited ace jack. It's folded around to the button, who makes a standard steal raise of three and a half big blinds. Right, and this guy is only stealing, you see this little 12% here, he's only stealing a total of 12% from the button, only 9%. So this is a pretty gutsy move that I make here, given his stats. Uh, but he's folding, yeah, he hadn't folded to a re-steal, and we don't have too many too many hands on him. But, yeah, so that's that's how it looked. Yeah, this is a relatively tight stealer, but I decide to take a shot anyways. We're both super deep stacked here. Um, at yeah, 180, 190 big blinds, and I three betting, so more or less three times his his bet size plus a small, 
pop it to 6, and that gives him pot odds of 1.8 to 1. So he needs 35% to be able to hit that flop. And he does call us. And flop comes. And we, we miss hard. All right, so we, you know, two suited, not our suits, by the way. We've got a, basically a running flush draw and a running inside straight draw. And that, you know, is the equivalent of an out and a half. And, you know, our straights can't be diamonds. So, yeah, it's just crap. So what we're doing right here is re-stealing from the big blind with a decent re-steal hand and c-betting into the pot representing the king and or flop threes and nines, for example. Or big, let's say, maybe a big draw, um, diamond draw. Um, yeah, a lot of stuff is out there. Anyways, we bet into it, knowing that he's going to let us go. Um, Actually, 33% of the time in our three-bet flops, but 65% at this point. And here, again, you know, um, in steel scenarios, these, when you're looking at c-bet stats and stuff like that, you need to be very clear that people are going to be playing a much wider range uh, the later they get, especially when they're first to act, right? So these stats can be misleading in steel situations, especially blind versus blind battles. Uh, just have that in the back of your head. So anyways, we go ahead and um, c-bet into that. Uh, two-thirds pot as standard, represent the king, and take it down. So, ace-king on the cutoff. And the whale limps. NL100, by the way, here, guys. We isolate. Four times the big blind, plus one, more or less, to four and a half. Okay, and I'm not only going to be doing this with ace-king, I'll be doing this with a lot of hands against this guy who is limp calling 75% and then folding to a c-bet here at 44. Uh, relatively high went to showdown, low end, but yeah, the guy's looking like a complete maniac, so, or actually idiot, um, playing every, nine out of every ten hands. <laughs> and yeah, that's quite a bit, given only uh, 45 total hands that we've seen from him. So we isolate with the ace-king, of course, and like I said, we'll do that with a lot of hands, not just ace-king. Uh, and we get cold cold on the button with a suited ace 10. Um, you know, we're both deep stacked here, or big stacked, and that's a playable move. Very speculative. You wouldn't want to do, you wouldn't want to make that call against somebody who's small stacked here, for sure. All right, and this guy then calls, as he's going to do most of the time. Limp call. And we flop a big swing and a miss. So we're on an inside straight draw. Uh, potentially with overcards, and yeah, let's see what transpires. So he checks, and we bet then half pot here, just over. And the ace ten min raises us. Now, min raises on the flop guys are very often extremely strong, and you got to be aware of that. Um, this I could have very easily gotten away of, or gotten away from right here. Right, I got my little two over cards, and actually I've only got three qu queens that'll help me that won't complete somebody's potential flush here. Um, the problem is, if somebody does have a jack, it's very often that he's over calling with an ace jack, uh, and in this case it was an ace ten. So, pretty funky play, and this is something that the guy should get a note for. Uh, and as you see here, Holden's already given him the calling station. I yeah, anyways, that could have been flop sets, that could have been uh, eight niners, that could have been queen kingers, right, that could have been suited aces. Could have been ace jack, ace ten, as he has here, right? And that means three of my uh, ace outs are, of course, gone. So this is actually, even given the good odds, this is actually a hand that you could get away from right now. Uh, just again, word to the wise. So I go ahead and call it, uh, having uh, yeah, five to one pot odds. Um, so I've got, you know, I've got my six outs, the queens for three. Call it nine. I'm giving myself four to one odds, more or less, very, very liberally. <laughs> um, good. So we call it anyways. And now look at the stack to pot ratio again, right? This guy's already at two to three, more or less, and pot's about half my stack. So he, looking at this, needs to be thinking, okay, time to push if the guy is on a flush draw. You know, I don't want him getting another card for free or for cheap. And, um, you know, it's not likely that necessarily I'm on the Queen King here. Could have been. Uh, it's also possible. But, you know, I hit my ace, unfortunately, and that's the problem with this kind of situation is I think I'm good here. And, again, 
when these jack tens kind of flop like that against overcallers, the very likely kicker is a king or an ace, giving him now two pair, which he does have. And so since he has mid pair and top pair now, uh, it's more likely that I do have the jack. So let's see how this goes. I decide to, to protect against a potential flush myself and or uh, straight draw. And yeah, having top pair, top kicker here on this really, really dangerous board. And this guy, right, having, I bet here, half of his stack size. Pot size already now 80. All right, so again, he's committed on every, I mean, every card on the river. This is not a call scenario. This is a push fold scenario. And of course, with two pair, it should have been a clear push from this guy protecting against everything else. And I don't think he does. He just calls him. And we <laughs> we river the miracle, um, and go ahead and put him all in for 35. And again, against these kind of weaker players, when you push all in, even when you know you have the guy covered, they they can kind of get scared. So bet the least amount if you want to get <laughs> paid off by fish. Um, they often get scared at the uh, higher higher number. Um, yeah, so good. Uh, another quick point here: this is the total pot is 148, but the effective pot is 147.80 because I have him covered. Right, and that also determines your pot odds. Uh, another thing is too, guys, um, as we're looking at these uh, example hands, the cards are being shown. So the pot odds that Holder Manager is calculating here is based on all known cards. So if I don't know his cards, the pot odds will be, I'm sorry, um, my completion odds, my equity will be a bit different, as will his. All right, just keep that in mind as we move forward. Next hand, okay, not a not a really big hand here, seven six suited, but it's a very strong hand um, to play blind versus blind in steel situations, right? You know exactly where you are on the flop. Uh, if you hit big, you play on, or you try and push your opponent off his hand. So standard three big blind raise, and we re-raise just as we had with the ace jack suited, with the seven six max max stretch uh, suited connector to keep us unreadable. So we pop it again, similar bet size, three times his, uh, his bet plus the blind, and big blind lets it go, and we do get called. Alright, so we flop here, seven, six, eight, <laughs> wrong two suited board, All right, so basically we're on an inside straight draw for the nine, and it can't be a nine of clubs, so we got three outs. Okay, but we do have what? We have the initiative, and this is a steel scenario. We're out of position, and let's see how we played this. Check, he checks, and now it's a decent card to make a move. If he's on a flush draw, he's going to let it go. Um, he can believe that I have the 10, that I re-raise, you know, with a 9-10 situation, uh, even 8-10, who knows. Uh, over pairs in 3-bet scenarios, of course, um, happen a lot. Um, Ace 10s, who knows. All right, so this card is a good scare card, matter of fact. You know, with a top top card then pairs on the turn, I'd probably take a shot. Let's see. Yeah. So I just make a half pot bet, knowing that he only needs a fold 33% of the time for me to take this down. All right, and if he raises, I can let that go, because we're both here quite, um, quite big stacked. And he does. All right, so again, don't play your cards necessarily. Play what your cards look like and um, know your opponents, know what you can get away with. This guy's only getting downtown 25% of the time. We had quite a few hands on him. Um, folding to a turn bet at every other time he's gotten there. So, yeah. That's how that went down. And also you can look at this as a, just to throw out another concept there, as a delayed C bet. So, on the flop, I opted for a check and he checked behind, so I make a delayed c-bet here on the turn. That's another concept that we looked at. This is, a, in this case, a c-bet bluff. All right, half pot size, and I know that I need to take that down 33% of the time to break even, and that was one of those times. Okay, so here we wake up with a monster in the small blind, similar raise size, actually exact same raise size. This guy raises to the three big blinds. And here we are with Ace King. Raise it up to five this time, and we get called. And yet again we whiff. <laughs> okay, so this time instead of 
playing a delayed C bet, I go ahead and represent either the 10 jack, uh, 8, 9, queen, anything, um, strong draw, etc. And I bet out half pot. Swing and a miss. He calls us. All right, and now the third diamond comes. All right, 20. We're playing here NL50, so we got 42 big blinds here in the middle, and um, both of us are still very big stacked. Matter of fact, and here I check, and he checks, and I got two cards for the price of one out of position. Believe it or not. Um, now here, when you know, he made a mistake, actually. Okay, he can't know what I'm holding, but I make a re-steal from the small blind. He calls it. I make a half-pot C-bet on a two-suited board, which, if you're paying attention, we had a thousand hands on each other, at least, um, would be relatively out of character for me. This, normally, I'm going to be betting this two-thirds pot size, and that's why you always want to keep your bet sizing exactly the same or very similar, adjusting again to your players. So... Anyways, I make that half pot bet, um, you know, and I will change it up from time to time, so whatever. But um, when he then calls me here, right, he should have been looking at this as a float potential, right? So if he calls me in position on a two-serted, highly connected board, when that turn card comes and it is a diamond, and I check again, or I check into him, say, this is a perfect spot for him to bluff, and that perfect floating scenario. Right, guys. So just keep that in mind. Um, we're looking not only at my lines of play, but also the lines of play of the opponents and hypothetical scenarios. Um, again, if he even if he pop, uh, pops a half pot bet here, I'm highly inclined to let that go, even though I do have you know the king for the second nut flush draw. Um, it's just yeah, it's just going to be difficult to hit, right? I mean, my odds here at this point, if he doesn't have any diamonds at all are still only 4.1 to 1, something like that. If he makes that half pot bet, right, I'm going to be right right at that if he's not holding the bear A's. It's just a really, really marginal spot for me. So that's, you know, that's again the power of floating in position. Right, now of course if he bets in two-thirds pot size, which he probably should given this board, um, also to increase his fold equity against me, then yeah, I can't, I can't call that, um, yeah, based on odds. Uh, and again, guys, when boards three suit up and especially when they four suit up action normally dies immediately so even if I were to hit that last diamond I can't uh, imagine a, a scenario where I'm gonna have implied odds and he'll pay me off right if he doesn't have a diamond um, worst case scenario of course I'm only holding the king right so he makes it two-thirds pot size semi bluff which would be brilliant right here and then if the diamond does hit of course I pay out the nose because I'm gonna bet into it he's gonna raise me up and I'll probably pay him off with the king. Right. So again, the power of the float in position, definitely add that to your arsenal. So he checks behind, and now I hit the king, and decide to do exactly <laughs> what he should have done on the turn, and make a value bet. Right. Okay, okay, he would have been, of course, floating. I make a value bet here uh, with the king, thinking I'm good. Uh, also holding a king here, making it less likely that he does have the flush. And, yeah, that's how it went down. So, I mean, Jack-10 would have, of course, flopped it. Um, Diamonds had me beat. The guy played poorly post-flop. That's why we're able to take that down. At relatively small cost, by the way.